In the previous lecture we discussed three categories of diuretics, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, loop diuretics and osmotic diuretics. Today we'll discuss the thiazide diuretics. As usual, you'll find the lecture's PDF down in the description. The thiazides are the most widely used diuretics. They are sulfonamide derivatives, such as chlorothiazide, which was the first orally active diuretic that could affect the severe edema, often seen in hepatic cirrhosis and heart failure, with minimal side effects. Hydrochlorothiazide, is more potent, so the required dose for treatment, is lower than that of chlorothiazide. Chlorthalidine, endopamide, and metolazone are not truly thiazides, but are referred to as thiazide-like diuretics, because they contain the sulfonamide residue in their chemical structures, and their mechanism of action is similar to thiazides. All of thiazide diuretics have equal maximum diuretic effects, but differ only in potency. They cause diuresis by decreasing sodium reabsorption, mostly from the distal convoluted tubule and this is done by inhibiting sodium in chloride cotransporter on the luminal membrane of the tubules, increasing sodium in chloride excretion, which leads to the excretion of very high prosmother urine. As we said before, in DCT, sodium reabsorption is accompanied by calcium excretion in urine. So, when thiazides inhibit sodium reabsorption, they decrease calcium excretion in urine, causing hypercalcemia in contrast with the loop diuretics, which increase the calcium concentration in the urine, causing kidney stone formation. So thiazides are suitable for patients susceptible to kidney stones. Thiazides also increase the loss of potassium and magnesium. With prolonged use, thiazides reduce peripheral vascular resistance. This is done by relaxation of arteriolar smooth muscle, causing vasodilatation by unknown mechanism. So we can conclude some of their adverse effects. The most frequent problem with the thiazide diuretics is hypokalemia, so potassium levels should be monitored, especially in patients receiving digoxin, as they may cause ventricular arrhythmias. Potassium deficiency can be overcome by using potassium sparing diuretics, that we'll discuss in the next lecture. Thiazides cause hyponatremia. And they also cause hypovolemia that can cause orthostatic hypotension. And as we said, they can lead to hypercalcemia. Thiazides increase serum uric acid, or known as hyperuricemia, and this is done by decreasing the amount of uric acid excreted by the organic acid secretory system, causing gouty attacks. So they should be used with caution in patients with gout or high levels of uric acid. Thiazides can cause hyperglycemia and glucose intolerance, so diabetic patients taking thiazides should monitor glucose, and adjust their diabetes therapy if needed. Let's talk about their therapeutic uses. The thiazides are a mainstay of antihypertensive medication. They are effective in reducing blood pressure in the majority of patients with mild to moderate essential hypertension. They can be used as a single medication but sometimes additional antihypertensive medication should be given to control blood pressure. You can watch the previous lectures when we discuss the other antihypertensive medications. Note that, the antihypertensive actions of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, are enhanced when given in combination with the thiazides. Although the diuretics of choice in reducing extracellular volume in heart failure, are the loop diuretics. Thiazide diuretics may be added, if additional diuresis is needed. The thiazides can be useful in treating idiopathic hypercalciuria, as they inhibit urinary calcium excretion. So they are beneficial for patients with calcium oxalate stones in the urinary tract. Let's briefly talk about the thiazide-like diuretics. Chlorthalidine, pharmacologically behaves like hydrochlorothiazide. It has a long duration of action so it is often used once daily to treat hypertension. Metolazone, is more potent than the thiazides. It can cause sodium excretion even in advanced renal failure. Indopamide, has a long duration of action. 
At low doses, it shows significant antihypertensive action with minimal diuretic effects. It is metabolized and excreted by the gastrointestinal tract and the kidneys. It is useful for patients with renal failure. That's all for this lecture. In the next lecture we'll discuss the potassium sparing diuretics. If this lecture was useful for you, leave like and a comment of your opinion, subscribe if it's your first time here and keep following us.